Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Health Bridge Podcast. I'm your host, Holly B, and I have another fascinating, fantastic conversation to share with you today. I have Miguel Batista on. Miguel created his chronic fatigue syndrome recovery program, which helps people recover from CFS or chronic fatigue, from long COVID, from fibromyalgia, and this time after dealing with debilitating symptoms of his own for four and a half years, which landed him in the hospital at 22 years old, not expecting to actually make it out alive. Now he lives a life of thriving health and he inspires others to do the same through his recovery system. He's helped hundreds of people learn how to thrive again. And I was very excited to have him on because chronic fatigue syndrome was my first diagnosis and is still occasionally the symptom that pops up when I push myself too hard and I don't respect my personal boundaries, right? I know that so many of you out there that are in the chronic health space deal with one or more of these symptoms or disease patterns that he coaches on and that he can speak to per- from personal experience. So I really wanted to have him on to share his story. What is amazing is that everything, again, as I always talk about, comes down to simplification. Let's simplify and figure out what the main framework is for recovery, right? We can get so lost in the long list of symptoms that we're feeling on any given day that it's so hard to know where to start, how to start, what symptom to attack first, what path of healing to take, what doctor to listen to. But it really comes down to the simple question of what is the root cause? And once we can figure out that root cause, which is basically the same for everybody across the board. How do we change the way we respond to it? So we really break those things down in this episode. And we look at some very common patterns that people who end up with these type of symptoms oftentimes have displayed throughout their life and especially leading up to when the symptoms started. It definitely applied to me, and maybe you'll see it in yourself too. We'll see. But what I love about Miguel's approach is that he really puts the, he puts the road to recovery in your own hands by giving you tools that you can use when flare-ups happen in order to change the outcome. I'm not going to tell you yet what that root cause is. I'm going to have you listen to this episode to really get the full effect of what we're talking about. And I hope that it gives you some relief to know that you can shift your experience. You can shift your health and recovery. You can create that by addressing this one root issue. So I'm going to leave it at that. Before we dive in, I have a huge ask of you. Will you please take just a moment to like and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you are listening or watching from? It makes such a big difference in the reach of this program. If you've been listening to my podcast for a while, what are you waiting for? Show me some love. (laughs) This year, I really hope to reach new ears because the guests that I have on are just amazing and They can help you. They can help your friends and family and your loved ones. Please share an episode with somebody that you think might resonate with the content that I put out because you never know what could change somebody's life and shift their trajectory. So I thank you ahead of time for doing that. And now let's dive into the episode. Miguel Batista, welcome to the Health Bridge podcast. I'm super excited to have you here. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me on. Super excited to share some of my story and just share some insights about recovery. So thank you for having me on. 
Absolutely. I think your story is going to be of interest to a lot of my listeners. I definitely focus my content, both with the podcast and with Instagram and with the people that I coach is around autoimmune issues and chronic health issues. So first off, let's start by just going over your story. Where did your health issues start? What happened? Yeah. So a whole lot happened. I could probably be here talking for 10 hours straight. I've done so many YouTube videos about my journey and everything, but essentially I guess, let me give you an overview. Basically today I'm all healthy. I'm normal. I can work out and I can travel. Don't have any symptoms at all, but at my worst exactly actually six years ago at the time of this filming, six years ago, I was completely bedridden in a dark room, living at my dad's place, getting literally spoon fed. And sometimes he'd have to blend the meals and I'd have to drink it. I remember he would blend like tilapia and rice, mix water with it. It was disgusting, but uh, I just couldn't chew. I couldn't move in bed. I was extremely sick. And I thought that was the final chapter in my life. But in the last six years, I've been able to have a new lease on life. But how did this all start? I would say I always had a a racing mind and racing thoughts since I was very young. And I can never really shut my mind off. I was always overthinking, overanalyzing. At the time, I thought it was normal thinking and normal analyzing. Looking back now and meeting so many people, that's actually not how a normal or regular person's brain goes. Like normally people can close their eyes and go to sleep, but I was that kid in daycare. It's nap time. And I'm looking around like, how are these people sleeping? I can't stop moving. I can't stop thinking. And it's been like that since I can, since I could remember. And early on in life, up until maybe I was 18, it that served me because me overthinking and overanalyzing led to good grades. Also overachieving. That was a huge trait that I had. That led to being team captain for sports, winning all these accolades, doing all these things. When, by the time I reached about 18 years old, I started to hit a wall. Not a wall yet, but I started to see signs that my nervous system, that my body was just, something wasn't right. Insomnia was really intense. I was getting, at the time, I didn't realize what it was, but it was lots of anxiety heart palpitations, almost like this panicky feeling, but I thought it was just normal. And I was, it's funny, I was actually quite addicted to pre-workout and energy drinks. I came from a very athletic school. So I used to sell pre-workout to all the kids there, right? So my locker was full of pre-workout. And they say the the worst thing you could do is dip into your own supply. But I had all these tasty pre-workout drinks. I'm like, ooh, that's strawberry. Ooh, that's blueberry. Drink it. And the next thing you know, I'm hooked on it. When I got to about 19 years old, that's when my body really hit a wall, right? And at this point, I had been feeling heart palpitations, getting insomnia, food sensitivities. I've been having that for maybe six to eight months at that point. I was even starting to bald a little bit. But there was this one day, I was a personal trainer actually, and I wanted to be the best, of course. And I was studying all these sales books. And I was working 12 hours a day, six days a week, skipping meals, just burning the candle on both ends. And so I go to the library, I'm reading the sales book and uh, I take this, some guy gave me something. It's like a pill for focus. It wasn't Adderall or Ritalin. He said, oh, I got it from Amazon. It's it's fine. You know, nothing's going to happen. So I took it. And next thing I'm sitting in the library, my heart is pounding. It feels like someone has a hammer and is just smashing my head with it. It feels like my blood vessels are about to pop. And then I can't breathe. I go, I get tunnel vision. I go to the front desk and I say, Hey, call an ambulance right now. Something's happening. And then they bring me to the back. I'm sitting down and it feels like forever, but a bunch of paramedics came in. They're giving me oxygen. And my blood pressure was 160 over 50. I remember. So very high pump of the heart, but the blood coming back wasn't as fast. Blood pressure was all whack. My heart rate was also 160 to 170 sitting down for about 20 minutes. Anyways, they took me to the hospital. They said, I thought I was going to die actually, but they were like, yeah, no, all your tests are fine. Your brain's fine. Your heart's fine. And it looks like you just need to drink some electrolytes. And that was the start of this journey, which there were many times it was just, it was hell, but that's what kicked it all off. That was the, the day that my life changed forever. And for the next four and a half years to five years, 
I was, yeah, it, I wasn't able to do so many things, but it was like that. I thought it was like that, but looking back, leading up to it, there were signs. But after that, that really changed everything for the next five years. But that's how I fell into this. It's interesting that you say it was that day that everything changed. But looking back, there are so many things that led up to that day. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so often tends to be a hindsight moment. Once you've been in this chronic health condition state for multiple years, Mm -hmm. and you start to learn a little bit more, you start to dig a little bit more, and you start to look back and you can actually identify like, oh, I had these patterns that weren't very healthy. Oh, I had these relationships that weren't very healthy. Oh, I had all all these little small things that added up to stress on the body or stress on the mind or both. And yeah. it's those little things that if we don't have ways of mitigating them and more in the moment, they can lead to big problems. It's like all these little signs come up and we brush them off and we brush them off mm-hmm. and we brush them off. And finally, the body's just like, dude, you're not listening to me. Like, I'm going to punch you in the face now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. So, and the reason people do that is because their mindset is almost too strong for their own good, right? You don't want to show weakness. You don't want to roll over and give up. You want to push through. And typically, people who get this kind of CFS or long COVID or any of these kind of nervous system issues, it's people who push through. Going back to that overthinking, overanalyzing, and perfectionist overachiever, they don't want to fail. They want to succeed. And that tendency to push through has actually led to good things in life. Whether it's getting the job you want or achieving certain things, it's great. But it is also a double-edged sword because that same tendency is going to cause you to, when you do feel symptoms, to be like, nah, that's nothing. Brush it off. Let's push through. Stay on the mission. Stay focused. But at the end of the day, your nervous system runs the show. And if you push too hard, it will let you know who's really in charge, right? And it'll ask for, it'll whisper first, you got a few symptoms here and there. Then it will ask you, it'll say, hey, buddy, palpitations, headaches, slow down. And then it will tell you, and then it will just take over. It won't give you a choice. And it will put you in bed until you learn to respect your threshold for stress because everybody has that limit. We do. We do all have that limit. And you're right. It's almost like a, it can be a survival of the fittest. I think Mm -hmm. that's like ingrained in us to not show weakness, to not admit these things. I would say it's probably even worse for men to admit when they're not doing well than Mm -hmm. it is for women because they're supposed to traditionally hold that strong line and be the provider. And so to admit for, especially for a man to admit that they can't, they're not holding up, that something's wrong. That's hard to do emotionally. Mm -hmm. And I think for women too, especially women that have families and they still need to work and they end up putting themselves last because they first need to go to work to pay the bills, to keep the lights on. They need to get the kids fed and into bed. They need to have date night with their husband to make sure the marriage is still good. All those things lead up to that burnout and that nervous system dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So yeah, there's so many different triggers for people to fall into this. But one thing for certain is it's not just one thing. It's funny. One thing's for certain. It's not just one thing. (laughs) It's not just one singular stressor that puts people into this. Because I've talked to so many people, as in hundreds of people. I don't know why the thumbs up came up. I don't either. (laughs) It's a new Zoom feature. Earlier, I was on a (laughs) webinar and a bunch of balloons came on the screen because I did something. (laughs) But it's not just one thing that causes all of this. When I've talked to hundreds of people, there have been There's thousands of followers on our channels and programs, and we see it all the time. People say, I got this because of COVID and they have long COVID, or I got this because I got that virus after I came back from that trip, or I got this because I smoked weed one time and then that triggered my whole nervous system. It's like, no, that was the final straw that caused your nervous system to break. But there's other people who get COVID or get a virus, but they don't get this. So why did you get it? oh, let's look at what happened leading up to 
everything changing because it didn't just change overnight. It feels like it did, but there were so many early signs where just like you said, hindsight is 2020 looking back. It's so obvious those things and those stressors that were stacking up. Right. And then when it gets to a certain point, once you go past that threshold, it's difficult to come back because once you go past that threshold, now your body's in survival mode and now you're having symptoms. And here's the problem. The doctor's just like I went through when I first got sick, they're telling you you're normal. They can't find anything wrong with your body. So your heart rate, like my heart rate was 160 sitting down, blood pressure was all through the roof. You would think there's a heart problem. And they said, no, your heart is perfectly fine. And that's not really something you want to hear after you go through something like that, right? Now you start to feel like you're going crazy. Now you start getting referred to specialists and neurologists and they're running all these crazy tests on you. And then you're almost hoping that they come back with something in the test telling you, hey, this is really messed up, but at least we can fix it. But no, they're telling you great news. You're perfectly fine. But that's like the worst news you could get. So yeah, a lot of people, they've been on the same journey. This happens. It changes your life, literally. Sometimes you can't work. You can't go out with friends. You can't enjoy birthday parties. The doctors are looking at you like you're crazy and you feel super, super alone. There's not a lot of people you can relate to as much as your family loves you. Unless they've been through this, they think you're going crazy as well because you look perfectly fine on the outside, but you do not feel fine on the inside. So what were the diagnoses that you ended up having? So there was a few, right? Somatic dysfunction, somatoform dysfunction, panic disorder, and depending on the doctor, because the doctor I was with, he was a psychiatrist. I was asking him, I was like, this sounds a lot like chronic fatigue syndrome. Is that what this is? Or myalgic encephalo, blah, 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 whatever. I told him and he's like, yeah, that would be the same thing. There's just different labels for it. Dysautonomia, same thing. Fibromyalgia, right? Because I had so much pain. I feel like depending on what specialist you go to, they're going to give you the label from their perspective. Because I was also told I had adrenal fatigue. And they said, all this is adrenal fatigue. And yeah, my adrenals were fried. Uh, my cortisol test was nearly flatlined. And they tried putting me on adrenal supplements and that made me way worse. They gave me hydrocortisone, which was, yeah, I thought I was going nuts. I didn't sleep for two weeks. I was scared of my own heartbeat. Every time it beat, I was like twitching because I was scared. I looked like, I don't know, like a drug addict withdrawing. It was, it was crazy. So yeah, that's what they diagnosed me with. There's a few different things. I think a lot of the listeners just like to hear that because they, by the time you get one diagnosis, you usually have three or four or five. Yeah. <laughs> they all seem to stack on top of each other. And it just, I think it's so overwhelming because with each diagnosis, with each label that gets placed on you, it is that weird thing where you're happy and excited to actually have a label because that means that maybe, you know, at least we know what's going on, but at the same time you're taking on that label and it turns into, or it can turn into like a mindset. I am this label. I am this sick person. I am this person that can't get well. I am this person that doctors don't know what to do with or that doctors mm -hmm. think I'm crazy. My friends and family think I'm crazy. So yeah, what I like about your approach is that I think you do a lot of focus on mindset. And I think you also go into like, why, why is our mindset the way it is? Why are we, why is our brain structured the way it is to put us into these patterns? When you work with people, do you start with mindset? Is that where you go first? That's one of the things I'd say, actually, our main thing, even more than mindset is it's isolating the problem. What are we actually trying to fix here? What is the root cause? And I actually just got done talking at a, a webinar about this. This was one of the focuses. What is one of the main frameworks in order to recover? That without this thing, it will be very difficult to actually get your life back. And that one thing is, it's finding the root cause, understanding what we're up against. What is the enemy? What are we actually trying to solve? And we pretty much sum it up to there's one problem. It's a hypersensitive nervous system. 
It doesn't matter if you have brain fog or POTS or even food sensitivities, insomnia, or the 50 other symptoms that come along with this nervous system issue. It is a hypersensitive nervous system. That's really what it is. So when people realize that, okay, we have one problem to solve, not 50 different problems, not 50 different symptoms, it takes a huge load off their shoulder because it's one problem to solve, one approach to one problem. And if you fix this one thing, everything else attached to it is going to be fixed. So that's a huge shift for a lot of people because no doctor's ever told them that. They're used to going to this specialist for this problem, this um, naturopath for that problem, this supplement for this symptom. And you're going to end up running in circles and you're going to end up on a downward spiral wasting your money if that's the case. I've never, ever met a single person who tried to treat all these individual things and actually recovered. And I've talked to hundreds of people and maybe they have recovered a little bit, but then they relapse. They'll make progress then they'll go backwards. Like we asked on the call earlier at this webinar, I said, how many of you have actually made progress in the past? And then it almost feels like you went back to square one. Every single person said, that's the whole chat blew up. So when you know what you're up against and you know what problem you're trying to solve, that takes a huge load off your shoulders. It lowers anxiety. It's very clear what you have to do. So that's number one. Number two is, okay, now that we know what we're trying to solve, we know what the problem is, how do we solve it? right? And we do that through the brain retraining side of things. And all brain retraining is, it's especially for this specific problem with CFS or dysautonomia, hypersensitive nervous system, all we're doing is reawakening certain parts of your brain that are designed to help your body function normally. So when you have this, basically the more debilitated you are, the more symptoms you have, the more your fight or flight mode is engaged, right? Because all that part of your brain is trying to do is protect you. So it's giving you all these symptoms to try to keep, try to keep you put, right? So you don't go out into the world again and expose yourself to stressors, right? So that's number two. It's okay. How do we reawaken the different parts of your brain so that you can walk without symptoms? You can drive, you can eat whatever you want without severe reactions and without this survival mechanism being triggered, right? And then once, once you figure out how to do that, now it's like, okay, we just repeat the cycle. Okay. We experience symptoms, we handle them, we respond well. And in doing that, we are literally reawakening the more normal parts of your brain. And after enough progress cycles, we call them of that, you get your life back. You're saying that the, the number three is basically shifting the way we respond to the flare-ups when they happen. Yeah. And when we can shift our response to them, we're basically training our nervous system to know that it is safe, that it can trust that we can take care of ourselves, that mm -hmm. we're not in immediate danger. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the whole reason people stay stuck in this and the reason the symptoms are there is because your nervous system does not trust you. Your brain does not trust you because up until this point, you have exposed your brain to too much stress, whether that's in the form of relationships or work or poor nutrition or poor sleeping habits, or you traveled somewhere and then you got a virus or something, your brain is going, okay, this person is adding on way too much stress. We can't let this person be in control. We need to take over. So if this person tries to get up and go over there, boom, we're going to give them muscle weakness, heart palpitations. We need them to stay put in hibernation mode because we don't trust this person. So you actually have to earn back trust with certain parts of certain parts of your nervous system and you do that by staying cool calm collected not going on downward spirals when you do have the adjustment periods but yeah in a nutshell cuz i i have over a thousand videos on my youtube channel and hours of content if i could sum up recovery into one sentence and if people just applied this one thing they would recover and they could forget about anything else it's this your success in recovery is determined by how well you respond to symptoms. If you respond well, you'll recover. If you don't respond well, you won't recover. And responding, what does that mean? That means when you feel symptoms, are you worrying about them? Or how much are you worrying about them? Are you saying, oh no, my heart rate's high. I'm going to have a heart attack. Oh, I'm getting shortness of breath. My lungs are shutting down. I have brain fog. Maybe I have Alzheimer's. Are you saying those things? And if you are, how fast are you swatting that thought away and telling yourself, 
this is just a hypersensitive nervous system. You need to stop that anxiety from going on a being like a freight train because once you go on that downward spiral, it's very hard to stop it. So you need to catch it early, which takes awareness. But if you can respond well and, and neutralize that fear and neutralize those emotions, you're not allowing that part of your survival brain to be active. That survival brain, it runs on emotion. So the more you can neutralize those emotions, the less activity there is there and the less symptoms you will have. It sounds a lot to me like learning to practice the art of surrender. So basically letting go of the things that you can't control Mm -hmm. and focusing on what you can control. So, okay, you are in the middle of a flare up. You can't just hit a stop button and make it stop, right? Yeah. But you can control how you're responding to it. Exactly. So are you right? So are you letting your mind spiral into all the what ifs and what might happen this time? And what what am I gonna do if that happens? Do I need am I gonna end up in the hospital? You're instead of letting that spiral go, you're going to control the way that you respond to the symptoms by you know, what, taking a breath, doing a relaxation technique, whatever you can do to trip up that response pattern that you have Mm -hmm. and show your body that it's okay. This too will pass. Mm -hmm. Like that's a, that's something I like to say. This too will pass. This too will pass. I am safe. We can repeat these things. We can have these things at the ready so that when something triggers, we have our game plan on how we're going to react, respond to this time, right? Exactly. And that's so important. You need to learn to let go of control. And for people who even develop this, those are the people who crave the most control. Talk about overthinkers, overanalyzers, perfectionists. They want control over everything. I know I did. So when you can't control things, like when you're stuck in bed or you're stuck at home and you can't go out even though you want to, you can't go to a birthday party, even though you want to, or even worse, if you are bedridden, you want to take a shower, but you can't because you're too symptomatic. So now it's like this downward spiral because you're so frustrated, but that's what this is trying to teach you. Your nervous system is trying to force you to learn how to be patient, how to let go of control, um, all of those things. And also going back to what you said, you like to tell yourself, I'm safe. This too shall pass. That's something I also told myself a lot, but I also didn't realize something else I was doing at the time. The nervous system, it doesn't understand spoken language. It understands emotion. So when you tell yourself these things, you actually have to, even just for a fraction of a second, at least feel a little bit safe. I'm not saying feel safe for 10 minutes or an hour when your heart rates through the roof and your body is going crazy. But even for one second, if you can feel safe and and believe and convince yourself you are or trick yourself into feeling that, at least you're setting an anchor point for where your nervous system is trying to get to, right? Or else you just don't, it doesn't even know, it doesn't even have a reference of where it's trying to get to. It's just stuck in this place. But if you can find that place for a second, feel safe, feel no fear, don't care at all for just one or two seconds, At least you'll create that reference point in your mind. And the more you do that, the the clearer that reference point will be. And your nervous system will always get be able to get back to that place of safety until you can do it just naturally and quickly. Yeah. And what's amazing too is that literally just one or two seconds of that feeling does have physiological effects in the body of healing. So for example, on a prior podcast, I was talking to Michael Amster. I keep, I feel like it, this keeps coming up. I've been reference, referencing him a lot lately, but he teaches about the power of awe and they look at it as a mindfulness technique, but because people are intimidated by meditation, right? You think you have to sit there and meditate and quiet your mind for 20 minutes to an hour, and then maybe you'll get some positive effects. This is basically finding little moments of awe throughout Mm -hmm. your day for literally just acknowledging it for a second or two and then exhaling and just that tiny little second or two 
can start to repair the nervous system response and it gets you momentarily out of fight or flight. Mm -hmm. Yep. They've been doing big uh, studies on this actually at UC Berkeley, I think, and, and finding lots of positive effects and also using it. They did a study recently with long COVID patients to see how it would help them move through their long COVID. So Mm -hmm. it just goes along with everything that, that you're saying and that you do with your clients. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And this is after literally hundreds of hours of working with people one-on-one and all the coaches too. There's three coaches in the program and they're on dozens of calls per week, one-on-one with people studying this stuff. And every week we're getting together putting our ideas together, seeing what's working, what's not. Why are people making leaps and bounds in recovery? Why are people taking longer? What are the patterns? And we're compiling all of this data and we're constantly refining the program. But that's one of the big things uh, that we we try to encourage people to do is like anything that can help you feel a sense of safety, whether it's playing the piano for 30 seconds or listening to your favorite song for 45 seconds or something. Maybe it's eating a tasty meal eating something good for 30 seconds, at least it gives your brain and nervous system a reference point of, okay, that's what it feels like to be normal. That's what it feels like to have very little to no symptoms. Because when you're dealing with this and it's been weeks and months and years, you lose what that feels like. You don't even know what normal feels like, right? So we need to start somewhere and we need to start with one to two seconds. And that's where it starts. That's where it started for me because outside of that one to two seconds, my body was on fire and I had about 30 symptoms today. I don't have any symptoms and I could exercise hard and travel, but it started with one to two seconds. So those one to two seconds compile on top of each other and it's basically just, yeah, it compounds and it's, it creates wins instead of like focusing on the failures. Yeah. So your nervous system is like, yay, we got a little respite instead of like, oh God, what's happening next? Yeah. Exactly. And and that's one thing too. When you're dealing with all these symptoms and you're having these flare-ups, you're seeing the world through a very um, negative lens. You're only seeing things that are going wrong. And this this is because when you're feeling all these symptoms, your your fight or flight center is engaged. It's looking for danger. It's looking for things that can go wrong because your primal brain, which is essentially your nervous system, it doesn't care if you're happy or sad. What it cares about, is this person going to be alive or are they going to be dead? We need to keep them alive at all costs. So it is constantly scanning for danger. And here's the interesting part. Even if there is no danger around, it will come up with danger on its own. It will anticipate things that aren't even happening. It might think, I wanted to go take a shower, but if I take a shower, I'm going to feel all these crazy symptoms after. What if I crash? What is this? this? It's, it's a lot of what if questions, hypotheticals. So here's a tip for everybody watching this. When you catch yourself asking yourself, what if that's a hypothetical right there, this is your, your fight or flight center talking. If you ask what if, and like 90% of the time, it's going to be what if questions you're asking yourself. What if I walk too far? What if I stood up too fast? What if I was on my phone a bit too long? What if I don't get good sleep tonight? These are all designed to keep you in fight or flight mode. So it's like it's your nervous system, your primal brain is dangling that bait right in front of you. And if you jump all over it and say, oh, you're right. That's a good question. What if I don't sleep tonight? Oh, then this is going to happen tomorrow. And this is going to happen. Guess what? You just took the bait and you're back in the cycle. So just understand it's dangling bait in front of you. But once you can see it from that perspective, you can almost laugh about it. When you notice these thoughts come up, you're like, huh, I know what you're trying to do. You're not fooling me. You might fool me here and there, but I see what you're trying to do. And you could see stuff as they're happening. It's almost like Neo in the Matrix. It's like time slows down. He sees the what they're trying to do and he could dodge the bullets. That's what it feels like once you wrap your head around what's really going on, what the issue is. I can see it also being disguised as, and you can correct me if I have this wrong, but when we have rigid expectations of things we set rigid like i need this to happen i need to get good sleep tonight so that x y and z that's happening tomorrow plays out perfectly or i need to be i don't know i'm blanking on a good example 
But if we set these like specific expectations on what is okay to happen and what isn't okay to happen, would that also be considered? Because that puts you into like, okay, I need that to happen. So if it doesn't, then what happens? So, so I guess it can be right back into that same scenario. Yeah. Yep. And that's one of the main concepts we're teaching in the program now, black and white thinking. You have to th- be thinking gray, the middle ground. You, you can't have any extreme thinking, especially when your nervous system is hypersensitive. So you're exactly right. Some people, they have a flare up and they're like, okay, this flare up should be gone in three days. And if it's there on the fourth day, they're like, I'm a failure. I'm going backwards. I'm back to square one. So it's this all or nothing thinking, but Black and white thinking, all or nothing, that is highly amygdala driven, which is your primal brain. That's your fight or flight center, literally. So the more black and white you are with your thinking, the more you're going to be in survival mode. So you almost have to to take a step back and not care about stuff. Like if it happens, if it doesn't happen, whatever. If I get sleep tonight, good. If I don't get sleep tonight, good. Who cares? Right. So it's actually like the opposite mindset that people have going into this, right? Most people going into this, overanalyzers, perfectionists, overthinkers, uh, high achievers, you almost need to adopt the opposite of that mindset if you want to get out, right? Because the only way to get out of this is to to do the reverse of what you were doing before, right? And I'm not saying be completely lazy and stop caring about everything, but for a temporary period of time, you need to do that, right? The less you care, the, the more progress you'll make. So less black and white thinking makes a huge difference. Let's talk a little bit more about the whole expectations and timelines of like, this flare should be let Mm -hmm. up in three days or six months from now, I'm sure I'm going to be way better. And then I'll be able to do family vacations and then I'll be able to dive back into my work and then this and then that. What happens when they don't pan out? how do we approach that? Cause it can have really serious effects on our mental health. Right. And, and on our relationships, people lose jobs because they aren't getting better in time and they can't perform. Like how do we start to reframe that scenario and create a different experience out of it? Yeah, that's a great question. And it goes back to what I said about staying away from the black and white thinking and extreme all or nothing and going into gray thinking. So like, for example, in our programs, There's a lot of people who, you know, oh, my son's graduation is coming up in five months. I really want to be able to stand up and clap for him. Right now I'm in a wheelchair. And we're like, no, that's a great goal. And we think you're totally going to be fine by then. But we don't want to set hard dates for anything because the harder set the date is, the more anxiety somebody will have as we get closer to the date. So while we can set certain milestones and certain, not hard deadlines, but soft deadlines, we want to be flexible with the plan. So for example, that individual, we told them, yeah, no, that's great. Based on your progress so far and based on everything we're going to implement, yeah, this should be, we should knock this out of the park. Shouldn't be a problem. But you have to be okay with if you're not ready by then, it's fine. You won't be able to do it, but you can go in a wheelchair. We could do something else, but don't be so set on doing it in such a specific way. So I think with certain dates or timelines, it's always good to be flexible, right? It's always good to be flexible because if you have that hard date set, like I said, you're going to have so much anticipation, anxiety leading up to it, which is only going to hurt you in the long run. And even just changing your perception, like, okay, let's say June 26th that's the date I need to be better by. So that's a very rigid way of thinking where you're putting pressure on yourself now, right? Which does not help the nervous system at this point. But if you say, okay, well, June 26, cool. That sounds good. Ideal scenario, I'd be standing up, clapping, jumping around. But if that's not the case, then I'll still go in a wheelchair. It's fine. And I guarantee you, the person who goes with the second option, the second game plan, they're actually going to recover faster than the first person. So I actually completely got rid of deadlines when I was recovering. So I got out of the hospital. I really only focused on my three-foot world. So the only thing that matters is three days from now, three days prior in terms of time, right? And then in terms of space, 
The only thing that matters is whatever's in my three foot circle around me. Anything else outside of that, I don't care. There could be a tsunami about to hit my city. I don't care. Like, what am I going to do about it? It's not inside my three foot world. So I became very good at blocking a lot of things out. But yeah, the three foot world really helps a lot. And this managing expectations and, and being flexible with it. I was never really a flexible person before, which is also what led me to getting this stuff. So this also taught me to be flexible, to not be so rigid in how I do things. And that's something you can teach a lot of other people too. And once you adopt that flexibility, you recover so much faster. You take the pressure off. I love that idea of flexibility. And a lot of what you said too brings me back to really the principles behind manifestation are very much the same. It's Mm -hmm. um, We can put out the idea of what we want to achieve. I mean, we can clearly define what we want to achieve. achieve. We want to be standing up and clapping at the graduation. Mm -hmm. But we have to take our own timeline out of it. We can't put expectations on how the universe is going to provide or God is going to provide how it's going to play out. Right. So it's, again, it's that art of surrender. We, Mm -hmm. we do what we can, but we don't have full control. So we're going to put out our, our goals and what we want to achieve, but we have to relinquish the control over the timeline basically. And we might think that our healing is going to go in this straight line because that's what's convenient for us. And that's how our brain can think of healing, but maybe it's going to go up and then down a little and then sideways and then up. Mm -hmm. It's, we we can't, we can't specify exactly how the path is going to look for each person. And I think that with also including the feeling that emotional aspect of, and you're saying the nervous system recognizes that the emotional state putting yourself in the the emotional state of being at the graduation and being able to stand up out of your chair, feeling the emotion of what that is going to feel like. Sure, maybe it won't come to pass actually at the graduation, but you're, you're putting yourself, your nervous system in a place where it can recognize what that feels like. And mm-hmm. it takes away some of that resistance. So it's like hitting on on multiple different factors when you're putting those things into play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And kind of piggybacking off of what you said in terms of timelines, learning to let go of control. Let's say this person wants to go attend this graduation on June 26th. That's five, six months away as of right now. That's far outside the three foot world. That's like six months away or five months away. So But why I like, I would actually ask them if they would push back on me, let's say in this scenario, they're like, no, but Miguel, I really got to do this. I really got to do this. I'm like, dude, three foot world. Why are you trying to time travel to the future and control an outcome? Because that outcome that's determined by what you do right now in this moment. So focus on right now. So right now, how are you responding to your symptoms and any of that stuff? Even overthinking in our program, we call overthinking a symptom. That's a symptom because People will overthink a whole lot more. They won't even, they won't feel like themselves when they're in a symptom flare. It's almost like they turn into a different person. We have this thing called video journals where people can vlog their whole recovery journey. Our team puts it together and updates that recovery diary, video diary. And you could totally see when people are in adjustment periods and flare ups, they're a different person from when they're out of an adjustment period or flare up. One person, the the way they talk, it's fast, it's frantic, very negative, very dark. And then when they're doing okay, it's it's like a whole different person. So it's just, it's learning to recognize that and just course correcting. Because also, like you said, recovery isn't one line up. You said maybe it'll be up and down. I would go as far as to say, not maybe, it will be up and down, like 100%. You guys will make progress. You will have flare-ups. You will be on this roller coaster of emotions sometimes, but as long as you keep course correcting and don't let it spiral out of control, you're going to have anxiety. You're going to have times of doubt where you question if you're even doing the right thing, but that's when you have to stick to it the most, right? So you can go off track a little bit, but just course correct. 
don't let it go too far off because in course correcting, at least you're course correcting and you're moving in the right direction. You're moving closer to thriving health. So for me, every time I was responding well to symptoms, that was one step closer in the right direction. So it's almost, I was just, I was just chipping away and you have to do that thousands of times on your recovery journey. Yeah. Think about creating a beautiful sculpture out of marble. How many chips does that take before you finally have that final, beautiful, amazing, polished piece? (laughs) Yeah. Right. And health is just an ongoing, it's an ongoing journey and we're going to be learning lessons our entire lives around it. So, Mm -hmm. So I think just like embracing that, the discomfort when it comes up, it doesn't mean we have to enjoy the discomfort. Doesn't mean we have to pretend that we're like comfortable with it, but just uh, embracing the fact that it's going to happen and it's going to be there. We're going to have flare ups, but Mm -hmm. we're going to learn and we're going to respond differently and we're going to keep moving forward with it is, is a really, that's just a really important part of the journey. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's not going to be all roses and sunshine. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And the flare ups, you have to reframe the way you look at them. You have to see them as opportunities for you to do the brain retraining and the wiring. That's when you can recalibrate your nervous system. It's like when you go to the gym, you're not growing muscle when you're working out, you're growing muscle when you're sore and your muscle is rebuilding on top of itself. So it's, it's very similar to recovery. You increase activity in a certain area, whether it's mental activity or physical or emotional activity, you increase activity, then your body hits you with these symptoms because of the stimulus you just placed on it. And then you have to pull back, right? Because you have all these symptoms. So instead of someone working out, going hard, and then feeling sore, you increase activity, but instead of feeling sore, you feel symptoms, but that's the opportunity for you to redo the brain rewiring. And if you do it right, yes, you unlock a whole new level in capacity. Same thing with working out. The next time you do the same workout, you're going to be able to lift a little bit heavier weights or do more reps, but you can't get stronger. You can't grow without that phase of discomfort. But most people see those flare-ups as horrible. It's bad. I shouldn't feel symptoms. That means I messed up. That's like someone going to the gym, doing a great workout, feeling sore. And they're like, oh no, I shouldn't feel sore. All right. I'm not going to work out again, but I still want to get stronger. I still want to run this marathon, but I don't want to work out because it's bad to get sore. That like you would think someone's crazy if they said that, but the problem is no one really teaches this kind of stuff when it comes to the nervous system. In fact, some people teach the opposite. They say, if you have symptoms, that means you did something wrong. Now, disclaimer, I'm not saying go out there and go for a run and go flare up a whole bunch of symptoms. There's a sweet spot, right? You only want to increase activity and stimulus to the level of symptoms that you can handle, right? So some people will say, how do I know how much to do? Because there's a delay in my symptoms. I'll do something and I'll feel it two or three days later. In that case, just take it slow. Take it slow. You're going to find your sweet spot. But don't be afraid of the symptoms and adjustment periods and flare-ups because those are necessary in order for you to unlock your life. You really have to earn your life back. That's why people who come out of this, they're so grateful and they see life from a different perspective because they don't take anything for granted because they had to earn every single activity back, whether it's working out or eating food or driving, they had to earn it back. It wasn't just given to them. I can totally relate to that. It's really like a hamster wheel of pushing myself. Like I used to work out a lot. I loved working out. This is back in college pre pre mono, which is the first obvious trigger, right? Mm-hmm. For all of my symptoms. And I loved working out. And as I thought I should be getting better from this going through mono. I would try to just go back and work out the same way I used to, and it would cause a major flare up. It'd be weeks before I could get back to the gym. And then I would get back to the gym and try it again. And boom, it would happen again. And boom, it would happen again and on and on. And if I didn't have the right mindset or nervous system perspective at that point to understand what was going on, it turned into fear. And it registered in my nervous system uh, in this fight or flight response. And 
before I would even try to work out again, I would already have the mindset of, yeah, this is the result when I do this. Exactly. And yeah, so it, it's not that I have it all figured out, but I finally recognized I had to take this so much slower than I was trying to do. And I couldn't do things the same way. So literally 10 minutes of yoga stretch. And it took me a while to get that into a daily routine, like a while. Finally, mm -hmm. I got that into the routine. Then I can build on that and I can build on that. And I have gotten to the point where I can do much more, mm -hmm. but it's, you have to be gentle with yourself and you have to listen to yourself and you have to not keep trying to repeat the same pattern and expect different results, right? We have to like take a look at things and say, okay, what do I need to learn from this so I can try yeah. something different? <laughs> exactly. And we tell people all the time, they can feel like a failure if they flare up, right? And they keep flaring up. They're like, I'm doing something wrong. I'm doing something wrong. Or I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done that. That was a waste of energy. And we tell them, you know what? It's only a failure and you only go backwards if you didn't learn something from it. Like maybe you, what did you learn about yourself through this flare up? What did you learn not to do? What did you learn to do instead? But if you keep making the same mistakes, then yeah, stop doing that. But if, you, if it's something that you tried and you didn't know and you flare up, that's fine. At least you learned something. So another thing is I don't, I think people should be less hard on themselves. And I can say that because I've come out the other side. I was the hardest person on myself. I would set the highest expectations. I better be fully functional by this summer. I need to be benching two plates by the end of the year. Next year, I need to be running a marathon or not a marathon, like deadlifting 315 pounds. It was so crazy. I'm like, how about let's just live without symptoms first? Like, why do we need to do all that stuff? So my goal was actually, I was just looking for the next step of growth. Because I really started from the ground uh, when I was in the hospital, I was completely bedridden. And I remember my initial goal was, let me just sit up out of bed. Okay. And then probably the biggest shift I had in the beginning was, all right, let me, this is going to hurt, but I want to go sit in that wheelchair. Went to go sit in a wheelchair. It was rough. And I was like, wow. Okay. Let me go to the washroom on my own. Okay. And that's over a week. What I just said, going from sitting up to sitting in a wheelchair, to go into the washroom. That's seven days, right? Stretched out over, that's a pretty long period of time for a small progress, but I was so ecstatic. And then the big kind of breakthrough was one day I was really hungry in the hospital. And it's interesting, actually, at this point, they were going to kick me out of the hospital because I was in ICU. They said, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. Your tests are normal. So we need to send you home and then you could just come back every day to see the psychiatrist. And I said, I can't even feed myself. Do you have any other options? They said, we have some extra beds in the psych ward. If you want to stay there, you, you'll be a volunteer. So you could go home anytime you want. But if you really don't want to travel back and forth, you, there's extra rooms there. And I was like, I know I'm not crazy. Okay. I could go home anytime I want. And I asked him, okay, is someone going to kill me in the middle of the night? Are they going to break into my room and like choke me to death? And they're like, no, these people, they're fine. They're okay. I was like, okay. So I go in there, they wheelchaired me in. And I remember there's people running backwards, like right by me. There's people like peeing on the wall. Like it was crazy. And I'm just like, how I don't belong here. Why am I here? But I was like, I can't go home. I don't have a choice. So anyways, I'm in a wheelchair one day and I'm like, I'm really hungry. So they weren't bringing me my food. So I wheeled out to the common area rolled up to a table and started eating with other people. And these people were, they weren't all there, but that was one of the best feelings in the world because for the first time in eight months, I felt human again. I was eating with real people sitting up at a table. And even though I was feeling symptoms, I was like, it's just such a breath of fresh air to, to not feel like a, just a ghost, to actually feel like I'm part of something because you feel so isolated. And even that small win, to me, that was everything. And then it's exciting because as you recover, as you make progress, especially in the beginning stages, the smallest things just change your world. When you can go from inside to now you're able to go outside and sit outside in the sun, 
that is a world's difference. That's like me flying to the Maldives right now. Like I'd be just as excited to go sit outside in the sun than I would be right now. Or, or if I won like a hundred thousand dollars, I'd be just as excited as I was then. But in the beginning, learn to enjoy the ride too, because as you're chipping away at this stuff, as you were talking about chipping away at a marble sculpture, rebuilding your life, you're actually seeing your life come together in real time over days, over weeks, over months. You're putting in this work, but because you're focusing on the right things that are actually fixing the root cause, now you're seeing all of this reflect in your life. You're able to laugh a bit harder with your friends. You, you can talk on the phone a bit longer. You can have family visit you a little bit more because they're not as triggering, right? You can feed yourself a little bit more. You can walk a little bit faster to the washroom. You can stand in the shower a little bit longer. So all these small things, it adds up. And before you know it, you're living a life with thriving health. And you're like, how the heck did all that happen? Sometimes I, I find myself thinking that. And it, it's putting yourself first too. That's a big part of this. So, like I was talking to somebody earlier today and she was struggling with the idea of really putting her health first. She's She wasn't bedridden. She's not to that point, but she is having flare up. She is having constant fatigue and she but she struggles putting her health first and her needs first because she's married and she has a job and she has dogs that she wants to, she needs to walk and all of the extra things, right. That we, that wow. take some of our attention and it's hard to say no mm -hmm. to things, but I reframed it for her and said, people that love you are going to, as long as you can communicate with them, right? Like let's work on the communication here because if they love you, they're going to want to support you in your health journey. And ultimately, while you might be taking some extra time and putting some extra boundaries on doing what you need to do right now to build up your health again, this is actually not just for you. This is actually to support your relationships in the long run, to be able to have a steady job in the long run, to be able to play with your kids and not just be watching them while you're laying down on the couch. This is for the good of all, not just mm -hmm. for you. It's not a selfish act in that way. It's yeah. Sometimes we have to put ourselves first so that we can be there for everybody else and ultimately everybody wins. So I want to put that out there too. Yeah. Yeah. And we, the way we sum it up in the program is you saying no today to certain things and no to people is you saying yes a hundred times over in the future. Going back to that graduation example, okay, let's say this person really wants to go watch your son graduate and stand up and clap and cheer and jump for joy. Okay. Let's say that's not the expectation. If we don't aim for that, you take a lot of pressure off of recovery. And guess what? A month after that, now maybe you're good enough to go on the family trip to Hawaii and you can go sit on the beach in the sun, sipping, uh, what is it? Not pina coladas, something with no alcohol. The Mai Tai. The Mai yeah, Tai. <laughs> the Mai Tais, right? And because you were patient for that little bit longer, you just opened up the door to so many more opportunities down the road. So there were so many times where especially after getting out of the hospital, I was saying no to a lot of opportunities and things and turning friends down if they want to hang out. But because I, I said no and turned things down early on, just for those first several months, now if my friends ask me, hey, let's go here, let's go there, let's go to you know Hawaii or Mexico, I can say yes because I had that mindset. I know when to draw the line and when to set boundaries. If I never had that, I would never be able to have the capacity I have right now. So Everybody watching is just understand that, just like Holly said, you saying no and you feeling like it's a selfish act right now, it's actually a selfless act for everybody down the line in the future, right? Because you're going to get, you're going to open up so much more capacity down the road, a hundredfold, right? So you saying no today is you saying yes to the next 10 opportunities in the future. So you're investing, investing into your health in that sense. Right. Not, you're not thinking about short term 
wins here. We're thinking long term. Right. Playing the long game. Yeah. Miguel, you've given us so much value here. Is there any Thing that we haven't touched on yet or any final thoughts that you want to leave with our listeners? Yeah. I just want to say that if you're watching this right now, this is probably not the first video or piece of content you've seen about people recovering or talking about recovery. And I know right now it might feel like you're almost an outsider looking in like, okay, wow, these people got great results. They recovered. But what if I'm different? What if that worked for them and it might not work for me because I have this other thing? And I thought the exact same thing so many times, but just know that as long as you've gotten your tests and scans done and you've gotten treated for whatever they found in the test and the doctors are now saying, you're on your own at this point, we've done everything we can. If that's the case, these principles will help you and you absolutely can get your life back. No matter how dark it seems, no matter how hopeless the journey feels at times, no matter if this feels like this is your last chapter, there is a whole nother life after recovery. And I think back to where I was six years ago, just looping back to what I said in the beginning, six years ago was a different life. I didn't really expect to live another month when I was in the hospital. And I came to terms, I accepted that, okay, I lived a good life. I've had 22 years on this planet and I got to experience some amazing things and I'm thankful for it. But I don't see how this, how I could get past this. There was a 0.001% chance that I'd actually make it out of this thing. And here I am six years later, I've traveled to so many different places, been on like 20 different trips. I started two different businesses. I can see my friends again, eat whatever I want, work out more than I used to. And my quality of life has surpassed even my previous quality of life to getting sick. So for the longest time, I thought I wanted to get back to my old life, but I realized, no, what you really want is to start your new life, the 2.0 version of yourself, because that's the version that will never, will never get this CFS again. And if you do, you know how to come out of it. And it's, it's the version of you that isn't an overthinker all the time, isn't a perfectionist all the time. And the version of you that is able to squeeze the most out of the lemon of life. And that's what's waiting for you in the future. That could be six months, a year, two years from now, no matter where you're at. But just know that it is possible, entirely possible for you to go from surviving to thriving, essentially. So never give up. Never, ever give up. There is a solution out there. And I'm glad you found this channel. Listen to Holly. Thank you so much for sharing everything with us. Uh, where are the best places for people to find you? What's your YouTube channel? And Yeah. yeah. So... My YouTube channel is CFS Recovery. You can also find us on Instagram, CFS Recovery. And we also have a free Facebook group. Just search up CFS Recovery Community of Thrivers. And we put out tons and tons of content out there. We like to give it away all for free, essentially. And then if people do want extra help, then we do have some resources for that as well. And they could just find them in the links in the descriptions of everything. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank yeah. you. You're very welcome. Glad to be here. Thank you. So now that you've heard this conversation and we discussed that the root cause of these type of health conditions, as well as probably the majority of all health conditions really, is that hypersensitive nervous system. Where can you start to recognize that in yourself? Can you start to be curious and investigate that possibility and see maybe I am in fight or flight? Can you start to listen to the thoughts that come into your mind and see if they fall into that fight or flight feedback loop of what if, right? What if this happens? What if that happens? What do I do then? What if I have a flare up? Again, I just want to bring you back to that those key indicators that you might be more in fight or flight than you ever realized. I know for me, I really didn't recognize that even until much, much more recently, really in the last six months, did I really start to realize just how much my nervous system still needs to heal from past experiences and from how I've simply operated my life in the past. 
So this is really an invitation for you to become more self-aware and to dive a little bit deeper and maybe ask some different questions than you've been asked before, either by yourself, by practitioners, by other doctors. There might be a little bit more going on underneath the surface than our lab results can tell us, right? So if you are lost in that confusing area of my lab tests look okay, like there's nothing specifically wrong with me that a doctor can find, but I know something is off. I'm, I have flare-ups. I'm having symptoms. What is it? What is wrong with me? This is where you should start. This is where you should put your focus. So if you're ready to do that, if you're ready to open the door to working on your nervous system to healing your fight or flight responses so that you can minimize and manage your symptoms better. We both help you implement systems and ways of retraining that nervous system response so that your body knows it can trust you to take good care of yourself and to respect yourself and to set the boundaries that you need. We would love to discuss this further with you. So reach out to Miguel, reach out to myself, apply for a clarity call with me where we can talk about this further and see if we might be a good fit to work together in in my program. I really look forward to connecting with you. We're still in January here of, of the last day of January, actually of 2024. And the, the, The New Year's resolution push has faded, and I just want to encourage you, now that we're going into February, to remember how important you are, to remember how important your life is, and that you are worth investing in. You are worth putting yourself first so that you can truly shine because when we're healthy we our our true nature can really shine through and it can affect others in that same positive sense so fight you this year don't wait just do it reach out to me and let's get you on the right path towards healing and vitality i hope to talk to you soon and i'll see you on the next episode of the podcast